You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Parallax Nick. Parallax Nick is a science presenter and YouTuber with a channel that focuses on sharing his thoughts and knowledge of science, history, and the multiverse at large. He looks to our past to place a present understanding in context, and hopefully a better grasp of the future. Parallax Nick, welcome back. Hi. Now, Nick, uh, you've made a lot of other videos other than Proxima, and one of the more intriguing ones these days is Planet Nine. You think it's there, or do you think it's not? I have a problem uh, talking about this, because one of the great things about Mike Brown, who is the big proponent of Planet Nine, is that he has this wonderful, concise, very layman-friendly way of talking. I don't know if you've listen to him give a lecture, but he's really, really good at it. And so I understand everything about Planet Nine from his point of view. But there are opposing views that say Planet Nine isn't there. And they've been there since the beginning. But they all have to do with incredibly complex ideas about orbital mechanics. And they go completely over my head. So I don't 100% know how they work. I just I, I know about them in in the vaguest terms the 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 opposition to Planet Nine, but I, and I've tried to understand you know the opposing views. But I but one thing I do know is that no matter how many opposing views Mike Brown is thrown, he still believes Planet Nine is out there, and he's not a you know he's not some amateur. He's he's one of the best astronomers in recent history. So I mean, if he thinks Planet Nine is real. And even if only he and, 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 and Constantine Batygin think Planet Nine is real, I think that's enough for me to say that, to keep the hope up that Planet Nine might be out there. Now, we recently found one of, one of, the, one of the things I'm probably going to talk about in my uh, top 20, uh, my top 10 uh, astronomical discoveries video. We recently found an exoplanet that has an orbit very similar to Planet Nine, supposed orbit. So that means, so that we've at least shown that planet nines are not impossible. I don't know if I'm willing to say 100% that it's there. I I do know, you know, what the evidence is, and it's indirect. But let's be honest here, by all rights, and by all the logic of our solar system, you know, Sedna and Biden shouldn't be where they are. You know, something pulled them there. What that something is, we don't know. But, I mean, in nearly every case where this has happened before, it's been another object. So, yeah, I I think that it's entirely plausible that Planet Nine is out there. I don't think there's anything crazy about making the claim, because there really isn't any reason it, it wouldn't be there. And it isn't an extraordinary claim to say that it is. And it's worth noting that the evidence mounts. You know, it seems yeah. like every few months some other object is found that's in a peculiar position, orbital position, that it had to have been yeah. put there. So I, I think that the skepticism is, you know, it's warranted, of course, in, in everything in science. Yeah. But yeah. it's it's not really a wild claim that there's another planet out there. Now, if there is another planet out there, mm-hmm. that's going to be interesting because that will probably instantly become one of the most interesting planets in the solar system because its circumstances to have been you know to exist out there could include things like it's a captured object from another star system highly unlikely but i think that it's um i think that it's i think that it's possible it's more likely to have been captured if it was captured it's more likely to have been captured when the sun was young and still in its birth cluster which which creates another problem because if it did get captured from another star in the birth cluster it's probably going to be very very similar chemically <laughs> to to the solar system so you might not ever really be able to say 100 percent that it actually formed around another star i i think sorry i, I don't mean to, sorry what were you saying no no go right ahead 
I, I, I was just saying, I, 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 um, I think that once we have its orbit nailed down, I think we might be able to, to eliminate some possible origins because there will be certain things that a captured planet would be able to do in its orbit that I think that a, 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 um, an expelled planet probably wouldn't be able to do. I don't know for certain, but I'm pretty sure that that's the case. So we might not be able to do it, but I think there, there are some um, orbital configurations that we can rule out. On the other hand, I mean, this, the, I, I mean, first of all, one thing that I've, I've never heard anyone talk about Planet Nine uh, is that Planet Nine, if it's out there, it almost certainly has moons. And I mean, what kind of alien landscapes would, you know, would be on those moons? This, you know, ancient icy worlds that have never seen the light of the sun. I mean, it's just, it's just really chilling and fantastical to think about. You could call it the Pluto effect where everybody thought, well, Pluto's probably a frozen, boring rock. And then we go there and we look at it and it is a very, very dynamic, a very strange place above it, most of the moons in the solar system. You know, if you compare, you know, that, that, the Pluto Charon system with, with say the moon or Jupiter's moons, mm -hmm. this is they're way more interesting bodies as far as geology goes. So it could be that effect. And then I also, as far as origins go, I think last I heard anyway, Batigan and Brown favored that it might actually be a core of a failed gas giant from the solar system that migrated out. So wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> to I, look I, at? I'm not sure it was kind of vaguely worded, but I think what he meant was that it was an ice giant. Because um, ice giants are sometimes called failed cores because they, they're supposed to be gas giants that didn't have enough matter to, co to grow into fully, for fully fledged gas giants. I think what he meant was that it was an ice giant because he, sa he says, I think the phrase he used was ice giant core. Well, even, even, if, even if that's the case, our two ice giants we have are weird. Why is Uranus so calm and cold? versus Neptune, which is way more dynamic, yet it's further out and getting less sunlight. So, Well, I mean, we thought Uranus was calm and cold, and then Hubble uh, caught the thunderstorm on Uranus a couple of years ago, and Uranus developed its own dark spot, and then it disappeared. And, and it has been, um, Uranus has been waking up. I think the, the problem with Uranus wasn't that it's um, calm. I think the problem was that we just caught it at the wrong time. It was going through um, a, probably one of its you know, high pressure seasons. And it just, the moment springtime started kicking in, it started to look a lot more like Neptune. Now, granted, Neptune is like that a lot more than, than Uranus is, and it seems a lot less seasonally dependent. But that's almost certainly because Uranus lost a lot of its internal heat, whereas Neptune still has a lot more internal heat than Uranus does. And there's the mystery of why Uranus is knocked on its side. Is that related? Yeah. You know, did a giant object smack into it and increase convectivity and let it lose more heat? So there's a lot of mysteries in those two planets. And unfortunately, those happen to be the planets that we don't really pay that much attention to, comparatively speaking, with a place that, such as Mars. I, I, I mean, I, I love Uranus and Neptune, but I'd be perfectly happy to go to my grave with the knowledge that I have about them if it means that I get to find out if there's life on Europa or life on Titan first. I'm sorry. True. We have True. so many priorities, you know. Um, it's, you know, I think that you know, you're, they're a bit like Mercury. Yeah, they're fascinating, but let's wait until we get everything else sorted out before we go back there. Now, this begs another question, Nick. Life in the universe and determining if there if, if it exists, whether microbial or um, intelligent. The Fermi paradox. Let's start with the technology first. What is your what is your favorite solution to the Fermi paradox? Oh, um, my favorite solution. I think it's your. I think it's also your favorite solution, which is that intelligence is rare. Life life is common, but intelligence is rare, and we we don't have a lot of evidence one way or the other about the Fermi paradox. But the simplest explanation is, and always has been, that they're beyond our current ability to detect them. If they they're almost certainly out there somewhere. But they might they they may not they may be on the other side of the galaxy, in which case we'll never know about them. And I think that if you look at the history of our world, life on Earth is 3.8 billion years old. Multicellular life is 600 million years old. Life on land is 400 million years old. And intelligent life, if you're being charitable, is about 200 million years old. 
And then you get to the, so when you actually look at the percentages, intelligence took a long time to get going on this planet. And even though there have been a lot of animals out there that I could conceivably imagine evolving into a sapient tool using species like octopuses and ravens and dolphins, uh, we're the only ones that managed it out of, you know, 3.8 billion years. And that's a, that's a lot of tries and we're it. And we, we, because again, we only have a sample of one. We don't know what parts of ourselves are necessary. I mean, we used to think that what made us special was our brains. And we went to the trouble of creating the Piltdown Man uh, to try and prove that. But it turned out when we actually looked at our fossil record and we're honest with ourselves, and yes, we did come from Africa, and yes, you know, our ancestors were chimp-like, and turns out they weren't really all that smart. They were, they, they, what separated us from our ancestors first was that we walked on two legs. Was upright posture a, a necessity for us to become intelligent? If we find another intelligent species, would we expect them to have binocular vision, upright posture? We don't know. Because we don't know, we don't know what it is that somehow kicked off that particular event in our in our evolution that turned us into what we are. Well, we do. We may have one insight in that. Really, uh, the four limb configuration that we have really is unique to Earth evolution. That came out of the fact that we evolved from a fish that had you know four suitable fins to become arms and legs eventually through evolution however if you look at nature in general on earth for a sort of a base configuration that makes more sense than that practically six legs it comes out as six legs so a six-legged ant might actually look more like what you would expect alien civilizations to look like physiologically than us as you know primates I but, and this is also, incidentally, this is why we make Mars rovers with six wheels, you know, and things like that. So there might be a utility yeah. there that right. causes convergent evolution among species and that the most common configuration you might find would be six legs. I, I mean, I, which... I, I think for us, it, I mean, for looking for um, like a large animal, like say an animal the size of a human or a, or a horse, I think six legs might be, if we can get by on four, I think evolution might say you don't need the middle two and, and, and just atrophy them. Because if you can get by on four, then you don't need um, the extra two legs. But I don't know. Well, that's the other question is, do they do, do, does it evolve into a four-leg configuration with two arms? <laughs> so, you know, like a centaur or something like that. Um, like a praying mantis. Or a praying mantis, yeah, absolutely. And these would all be things that, that have precedent in physiology on earth you know but again this is highly speculative because we could find an intelligent alien civilization that looks more like a blob or a jellyfish or something like that who knows because also you have again you have, i mean we say that because we're so used to it i mean i i, I have to wonder um if we're actually going to find like an intelligent blob i mean i just i i i don't see how um an a blob like amoeba creature could become a, a telecommunicating sapient species. I could be wrong, but I mean, it just seems to me that a blob-like creature, maybe it could have the ability to manipulate objects. Maybe you could see it, you know, developing fire, but I would, I, I, I couldn't see it riding another animal, for instance, or, um, you know, fluff piloting an aircraft. You know, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, what are, you know, what are the limits to our, you know, how, how ridiculous is the humanoid alien is a question that I think doesn't get asked enough. First contact is all fun and games until you realize you're talking to a blob riding a goat. <laughs> now, I have to ask a question too, that we're making the assumption of nature, that, that an alien civilization would be the product of evolution. On the other hand, what if they are lords of their own evolution and they can reconfigure and do anything they want, including look exactly like a human if they wanted to? Just simply, you know, 3D print an organism and put your, your consciousness into it. In which case, all bets are off and that in the future, we won't even look like humans. We'll look like whatever we want. So, and that's not that far down the road, you know, a thousand years maybe. Yeah. So, yeah. You, you know, you have to ask that question. 
Well, I, I wouldn't even be a thousand years. It's, that's technology I think we'd have in maybe 200 years. But again, would we want to? Um, I mean, people are still going to find certain physical traits sexually attractive. I mean, they're always going to be the weird outliers and the fetishists out there. But I mean, yeah, they're going to be people out there who are like, you know, screw the rest of you guys. I'm going to go off and do my own thing and I'm going to turn myself into a walking rabbit, but into a, into a giant bipedal rabbit. But I think what's more likely to happen is that we'll have a slave race that'll do that for us. Like, you know, we'll have, you know, what are, what are essentially, like I said, replicants that we can configure however we want and then, you know, use them until we break them. If one wants an instant career on YouTube, become a giant bipedal rabbit. And as long as you're the first person to do yeah. that, you will get a million subscribers. I know it. <laughs> now, yeah. and it, so rare intelligence is your solution to the Fermi paradox. And again, it, as you said, it's my favorite one. However, I admit yeah. that I could be wrong and that there are, yeah. there are Fermi paradox solutions out there such as a watching, waiting machine civilization, waiting to pounce and things like that, that, yeah. that frankly scared the dickens out of me thinking about. And I don't want them yeah. to be viable solutions to the Fermi paradox, <laughs> but nature doesn't care what I want. So it, it's going to be what it is. So there are those too. And I've also been thinking lately about the idea that we just have only barely looked. You know, if you look at, at telescope time and, you know, Adam Frank recently wrote an article about this, that we really have just barely looked and that there yeah. could be alien civilizations all over out there. And we just haven't spent enough time looking to see them. Um, yeah. So it's too early. Human beings are, sorry, hum, sorry, human beings are impatient. We, we, have, we have become a very impatient people. And I think that's just a product of our time. You know, human beings used to be a lot more patient because the future was not was not supposed to be like like uh, was supposed to be was not supposed to be any different uh, than in the present. People just you know they could let days go by. Now we want everything now 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 now, and it's going to be a while before we get anything like confirmation of intelligence. I think. As for reapers. Um, I, I'm not that concerned about, uh, the, the so-called berserker hypothesis that there's some kind of monster out there waiting for us to devour us. Should we pose a threat? Because quite frankly, if they were going to do that, they would have done that by now. You know, I do like the sort of mass effect solution to that, which is that they're waiting for us to become that intelligence. So that we, you know, basically, so we ripen as a civilization because we're juicier if we're more advanced. But I don't really think, and while, but I think that while that, make, that makes good science fiction, it doesn't really make for a very good Fermi paradox solution. I think that the, I, I think it's far more likely, as um, a Russian uh, astronomer posited a couple a couple months ago, uh, that if the if the Reapers are out there, they're us. Um, we the you know the the most likely answer to the Fermi paradox is that we are the first civilization to attain the level capable of traveling to other stars. And we are going to be the ones that go out there and destroy every other planet and, and break it to our needs. And, you know, basically push all the pe people living there on reservations and turn all the far, turn all the wilderness into farmland and my, and turn all the mountains into mines, because that's, let's be frank, that's what we do it does make a certain amount of sense that the first intelligence out there would by definition make the galaxy comfortable and safe for itself and not for anyone else and the only and it also makes a certain amount of sense that that intelligence could be us and that brings us back to proxima b because what if we find it's very earth-like as in better than Mars and we could go and colonize and terraform it. If there's anything there, it needs to fear us. <laughs> you know, we, we are definitely the reapers in that case. <laughs> so, you know, that's how you end up getting, you know, wrath of Khan where yeah. it's, you get, is it something we can transplant? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, 
I hope to God there are no intelligent, there's no intelligent life on Proxima B. I, you know, it's, um, that's one of the things, I mean, it's been suggested that if it's, if there is, uh, if that did come from Proxima B, which is entirely possible, um, it didn't, but if it did, it might've been a beacon and I hope it's a beacon <laughs> because I really, um, I really wouldn't want there to be a, like, um, uh, a Navi or a Maori race on Proxima B, which, you know, waiting for us to show up because I, I, I really don't think that, uh, they would have a very good time of it. Human history says they would not. You know, by and by and large, whenever a group of humans interacts with another group of humans, it generally usually doesn't go well. On the plus side, I mean, as as Fraser Kane Fraser Kane often says, uh, gravity wells are for suckers. Maybe by the time we reach the level of technology required to get to Proxima B, we'll be used to living in O'Neill cylinders. We won't need to land on Proxima V. We won't need to set up a colony on Proxima V. And that's, you know, that's interesting because that's the Jeff Bezos plan is that, you know, if you, yeah. if you're living in space and it's superior to living on a planet, your planet returns back to its former state with a, a skeleton population and becomes a nature preserve. And that yeah. you just wait for it to develop into yet another intelligent species to join you up in space, which I like that view. That's a peaceful view. And I would... Yeah. I would I would live on an O'Neill cylinder, would you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, to, to me, I mean, this is the thing when people always tell me, you know, why are you, know, again, I'm sure you must have heard this from people. Why are you talking about colonizing space when we've so screwed up our own planet? The best thing we can do to help our planet is get off it. <laughs> That's true. Yep. And And people also <laughs> tend to sort of look at things like, well, we shouldn't change you know, Mars, we shouldn't contaminate it or whatever. It's a rock, you know, and I guarantee you there are billions yeah. and billions of planets identical to Mars in this galaxy. It's there for the taking and it sh let's let's disassemble it completely and make it into a, you know, a Dyson swarm, <laughs> you know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to disassemble it completely. I mean, I think that, I mean, I mean, Mariner Valley would be amazing at sunset. You know, and I'm pretty sure there's probably a microbiome there that I would want to study before, you know, disassembling it. So, I, I mean, I, it's there, there are reasons to keep Mars alive. I, I, we could put up a memorial or something, a signpost. You know, this, this is where Mars was. This is what it looked like. <laughs> <laughs> but perhaps I am too optimistic and heady. Now, the one other thing I wanted to talk with you about in regards to the Proxima Centauri system is there is another planet there, Proxima C. Now this appears to be a frozen world, but yeah. there was an oddity there. It apparently turned out to be really reflective. Tell us that story. Oh, uh, well, yeah, this I'm not 100% sure about because it was one data point. It was just one observation. So, and it wasn't, it was only one observation out of like several dozen. It is a curious observation, and it's pro it doesn't seem to be an artifact, but apparently, because Proxima C was confirmed, actually it was kind of a cool story that it was confirmed in Hubble data from 25 years ago, but uh, it was confirmed, so people knew it was there, and it was just far enough away from its star that they thought maybe we could get a direct image of it. And the problem was that the, the telescope that they used, they really had to push to its absolute limit in order to get a decent picture. But they got the picture and it turned out it was too bright. It was like six times brighter than it was predicted to be for an object of its size. And so they, you know, the question was why? And they came up with this idea that there was this ring system around it, which would have been like five times as wide as Saturn's. And I, you know, they, the problem, of course, is that Saturn's rings are a temporary feature. Most people think the most astronomers studying Saturn's rings think they're probably going to be gone in 100 million years and that they probably weren't here 100 million years ago. So the chances of us catching one of those ring systems at that moment and Saturn at the same time seem a bit unlikely. So I'm willing, I'm willing to think that maybe it was just an artifact of the camera, the fact that we were pushing this camera to its absolute limit and we ended up getting that picture. I'd love it to be true if it gets confirmed. It's one of those things where you really, really want a second opinion and another observation. And when it does, we'll know. Mysteries, mysteries, mysteries. And that's that's why we do this, isn't it? Uh, the mysteries of the universe. All right, Nick, we are out of time. It was a 
wonderful chat, and I hope you'll come back sometime and visit us again. Oh, I, I, I'd love to come back. John? What? You've not had the use of land transport for six months, so I've taken it upon myself to craft a replacement. Oh, wonderful. A car that Anna built. Yeah, even the brand name, Anna built. What's wrong with that? Anna, the speedometer only goes to 30. That's 30 kilometers, John. Anna, why is the upholstery made of carrots? Those are premium banana fibers, John. I don't know if the possum's gonna like what you did with his bananas, Anna. Please check turn signal fluid level. Fiddlesticks! The possum stole the car! He's gonna drive all the way to Minsk! Automobiles. Can't live with them, can't live without them. And on that note, thanks folks, and be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Uh, John, the bell's in the car with the opossum. What?